Okay. Um, so thanks for uh, listening to our talk today, folks. Um, today we're going to talk about valve systems in Georgia and how they're shaped by politics and ethnicity. Um, so to start this talk, I want to uh, sort of get talk about how we got into this project a little bit. Um, and really the thing we're interested in is the changing landscape in Georgia. And by changing, it's changing in a lot of different ways. Um, so demographically, we're seeing a lot of changes, right? Initially, we had indigenous folks in the area um, and then white and black folks coming in through colonization. And then now we have more in-migration since the 50s or 60s um, from other areas in the United States. Um, and that's also seen an increase in like Asian and Latinx groups in the area. So there's a lot of changing demographic shifts going on. At the same time, there's linguistic shifts going on. Um, so the Southern Val shift is receding in the area, and that's partially related to this influx of people from um, other parts of the country. Um, and lastly, the sort of extra bit that's sort of on top of all of this is like as demographic stuff is changing, linguistic stuff is changing, culture is shifting. Right, so uh, shifting norms and evaluations with respect to what Georgia is, what it should be, um, what it's going to be, and also how language connects to that. And what does it mean to like talk the way you do in Georgia? Um, especially for us, we're interested in sort of how Georgia's become a little bit of a purple state. Um, if you follow the election at all in 2020, you're probably acutely aware that Georgia is kind of in a state of flux with respect to like political orientation. Um, and that's connected to language and stuff like that too. Um, and so we wanted to explore that in a little more detail and say like, okay, what's this connection between the changing political landscape and the linguistic landscape in the area? And secondly, talk a little bit about ethnic variation in the region. Um, so this was not necessarily the thing we were coming in to talk about as much as in generating the corpus, um, but as you'll see, we have a really good representation of the different groups that have um, uh, come to Georgia. And so we want to show you kind of the general ethnic variability that's going on as well. Um, so first, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what I mean by like politics and the decline of the SVS. So by SVS, I mean the Southern Val shift. Um, and as you may know, it's in retreat among younger white speakers, especially in like urban areas. Um, George is no exception here. Um, in Atlanta, the Southern Val shift is in retreat among younger white speakers. Um, so we know that's happening. But I would also argue that the Southern Val shift is a change from above. Um, so that's a change that people are very aware is going on and they're positioning themselves with relation to it based on how that's evaluated. Um, people have really strong feelings about the Southern vowel shift and the Southern accent. Um, and because of those strong feelings, they have tendencies to distance themselves from it or accept it and say like, hey, you know, this is something I want. Um, but given that, um, we're sort of arguing that maybe political positioning because of the connection between Southerness and these ideas of like, hey, you know, being Southern means being conservative or something like that. There's sort of an indexical connection there. Maybe one's personal political positioning affects whether or not they're going to keep or main, uh, keep or lose the um, Southern vowel shift. Um, and this has been shown with other regional white varieties, specifically like D'Onofrio and Benheim's work in uh, Chicago, looking at the Northern city shift and finding these sort of like conservative orientations with um, certain beliefs leads to maintenance of the northern city shift. So maybe we're seeing the same thing with respect to the southern vowel shift as well. Um, secondly, the role of race and ethnicity is um, a little more general and descriptive. Um, and we're kind of interested in painting a picture of what's going on across groups um, in Georgia right now. Um, there's a lot of variability regionally, obviously, within ethnic groups. Um, and there's also variability between ethnic groups. Um, and so we wanna see whether some common ethnoelectal differences that we'll talk about when we get closer to the vowel portion of this, um, whether they're present for non-white speakers. We have a diverse corpus of 65 young adults recorded, recruited through a university in Atlanta from both the school's psychology pool and students' classmates and their friends. And perhaps most importantly, all of these participants grew up in the state of Georgia with 11 who lived outside of Georgia for up to eight years. And if you're interested in hearing our speakers who consented to sharing their reading passages online, you can find those at the link on screen and we'll also be sharing some examples throughout the presentation. So with each speaker, we started with a sociolinguistic interview and right afterwards, we also recorded a reading passage. Each of the interviews and passages were transcribed using prod text grids, and these were then run through Darla, created by Dartmouth College, which also which aligned the transcriptions and extracted the valid formants, which were normalized by speaker. 
Finally, the participants filled out a survey of demographic information and political beliefs. We gathered demographic information, including the basic things like their age and their ethnicity, as well as information about where they've lived, as well as their parents' education and where their parents have lived. Additionally, give, using their given hometowns, we have a continuous measure of rurality using county median income. Um, their political beliefs were measured both by asking about their actual votes cast in previous elections and through a 12 item scale, which measured their feelings on political issues such as patriotism, guns, and abortion. And this is an example of um, the questions that the participants saw. So the first one you can see is how positive or negative do you feel about regulations on businesses on the scale of one or of zero to a hundred or zero is very negative and hundred is very positive. And we have a chart of our participants across gender and ethnicity. As you can see, uh, 35, 35 of our participants were white with 23 of them being white women. And we've had eight black participants, 11 Asian participants, uh, five Latinx participants, and six who identified as mixed race. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about like what variables are we interested in here? So we're interested in vowel systems, but we're gonna be interested in different features for question one and question two. For the politics and the SVS, we're interested in the SVS. Um, so this is a graph of, graph of the southern vowel shift, if you're not familiar with some of the features of what's going on here. I've drawn a little box around the bottom left because these are the variables we're going to focus on. Um, if you're looking at younger white speakers, these are the places you're probably going to actually find any features of the SVS at this point because a lot of them are retreating and these are the last ones to go. Um, but we're going to be interested in the lowering and backing of uh, face, raising and tensing of dress, um, the raising of trap, and then the monophthongization of I, like in prize, um, coming out more like prize. Um, so we're going to be looking at all four of those um, with respect to our first question here. For our second question, it gets a little more complicated because we might have different expectations of what's going to be interesting depending on ethnicity um, in our corpus. Um, so for Black speakers, everybody in our corpus is African American. So we might expect some features maybe of the African American vowel shift where we get these lax vowels that are tensing and raising, sort of kind of looking like the Southern vowel shift here. Um, we also might get back vowel retention. And what I mean by that is back vowels staying in the back of the vowel space. Um, so both in the Southern vowel shift, as you saw in the previous slide and in mainstream US English, O and U both front, goat and goose both, both front, um, and that's not always true for African-American varieties in different regions of the United States, though so this is variable, um, and we want to check that. Secondly, for Latinx groups, there are a lot of things we could check, but we're going to focus here as well on back vowel retention, um, so keeping O and U in the back of the vowel space and not fronting them there. Um, and lastly, we're going to talk about um, Asian speakers. This gets a little complicated because this is really variable with respect to ethnicity. So we're kind of combining a lot of groups here. So we can't make too many nuanced differences, but there's been work both on back vowel retention again. So O and U not fronting for a lot of Asian ethnic groups. However, um, there's also some work, especially on the West Coast, seeing that like Asian women are leading the low back merger shift, um, which is the shift uh, shown over on the right here. Um, so the low back merger, we're not going to look at in particular, but the beginnings of the shift in orange, um, the trap backing especially, is the first thing that happens in that. Um, and we might be interested to see whether or not any sort of lead in a new change might be happening in our corpus as well. So to kind of like sum up, like, what am I interested in with respect to ethnicity and regionality? And we'll come back to this. Um, we're going to focus on the front lax vowels, dress and trap um, for these because they can either raise in tense for certain groups, we might expect that, or we might see some lowering and retracting if it's something like a low back merger shift. Um, and for the back vowels in every case, we're just interested in fronting or not fronting. Um, measurement wise, for face dress and trap, we're gonna be looking at the vowel diagonal at 35% duration. And if you're not familiar with the vowel diagonal, um, what that is is a joint measurement of uh, movement along the front of the vowel space, that front diagonal. Um, so it jointly measures F1 and F2 at the same time. Um, and we're looking at 35% duration because we want to look at the nucleus of the vowel for especially the southern vowel shift. These things get diphthongal. So we want to see where the vowel starts, um, not where the diphthong goes to. 
Contrastively, in prize, we're really interested in the diphthong. So we're looking at the diagonal in the front vowel space, but we're doing it at 80% duration, right, to get that diphthong and how long it goes. Um, for goose and goat, um, we can look just at F2 because we're interested in fronting, and we'll be looking at 35% duration or the nucleus of that as well because it has a diphthong off -clay. Um, Analysis-wise, we'll be looking at mixed effects linear regressions in R. Um, so uh, the dependent variable in every case is going to be a vowel measurement, whichever one is appropriate for the vowel, as I've talked through already. Um, controls that are in every model, we're going to have internal constraint stuff, so stuff like duration, place manner voicing, um, post coronal effects for the back vowels, um, and random intercepts for speaker and word, and that's going to be in everything. Um, the stuff that's unique to each question, for the politics question, we're only focusing on white speakers because of the really complicated entailment of something like the SVS and race and politics altogether. Um, this, we understand that that would be a really, really complicated interaction and we don't really have the data to do that for anyone but white speakers right now. Um, so focusing on the SVS and focusing on white speakers, um, we can look at gender as well because we've got a good amount of data there. Um, we're also using that county median income as a little bit of a control of social class and kind of rurality because we would expect those things to be correlated with political beliefs. And we want to make sure that if we're measuring political orientation, we're not just measuring social class by another name, right? We want to make sure that this is something unique. Um, and lastly, that political orientation score is the variable of interest really here. Uh, for Q2, um, for race and ethnicity, we're putting all speakers in the regressions for each vowel that we're interested in. Um, we can't talk about gender because we don't have enough to interact it, and that's really how we want to talk about it or anything like that above. Um, but we're going to look at general group level differences. Um, for each model set, um, things were tested iteratively for FIT via AICC, which is corrected for small sample sizes, and it's just an information criteria telling you which of these is the best model fit to your data. Um, and for each of the results, we're going to talk to you about the best model candidate for each vowel um, and the significant results that came out of it. Um, and moving to like the beginning of the results here. So we're moving to question one, again, with political identity and how that shapes the maintenance or loss of regional white varieties and here the Southern vowel shift. Um, and our prediction here would be that more conservative speakers are more likely to use more SVS vowels following the findings in the, S, uh, the Northern city shift and also kind of the indexical connection with the South and those sorts of beliefs. Now turning to the results, indeed as predicted for our first question about the role of political beliefs in the vowels of white speakers, as predicted, we found that more conservative speakers have more Southern variants of prize, face, and trap. So we're gonna start with prize, that's the top plot here. The x-axis is the speaker's um, conservatism score with the far left being the most liberal speakers and the far right being the most conservative speakers. They're color coded by their vote in 2020 with red being people who voted for Trump and blue being people who voted for Biden. Every dot is the model's predicted diagonal for a vowel token controlling for phonetic context. And the, uh, the y-axis here is the vowels diagonal at the 80% duration. So a more monophthongal pras vowel would have a lower diagonal at the 80% duration. And as predicted, you see in this graph that the more conservative speakers have a lower backer, more monophthongal pras vowel at the 80% duration, consistent with our prediction. And I'll play you some clips here. First, we have a white woman who voted for Trump. So these people in the library, I'm gonna go join them. And now one who voted for Biden. Like you tried on different. Library. Tried. Library versus tried. And then now looking at the lower graph, here we have their predicted um, uh, diagonal for the face vowel, where again, a more conservative speaker would have a, um, is predicted to have a lower and backer, more Southern variety of face. And indeed that is what you see in this graph where the, uh, the more conservative speakers have a lower and backer, more Southern variety of face. And the more liberal speakers have a, a higher and fronter variety of face. And I'll play you some clips here too. First, starting with a woman who voted for Trump. But yeah, then I switched my major to neuroscience. And now one who voted for Biden. Changed my major from... Major to... Major. Now turning to the role of gender among white speakers. So here we see um, that perhaps unsurprisingly, men have more Southern and also less low back merged variants of trap, face, 
and dress. So as you see in this graph, this graph has the F2 mean as the x-axis and the uh, F1 as the y-axis. Here we see that men have a higher and fronter trap, women have a lower and backer trap. And the same is also true of um, face and dress with men having the more Southern varieties and women have the, having the lower, uh, the more low back merger, less Southern varieties. So here I'll play a man saying the, uh, the trap vowel. I'm a math major. And now a woman. A distance hang with mass, but. Math. Mass. And then now here we will have a, a man saying the face vowel and then a woman. There's not really that many places in Atlanta. But then sometimes they like try and make like. Places. They make like. Now turning to uh, question two, which was about the role of ethnicity, describing how describing ethnic variation in our corpus, and again looking for evidence of the African American vowel shift, um, the the backing or non fronting of the back vowels for um, for various speakers, as well as the um, possible low back merger shift that's been suggested to be um, led perhaps in some cases by Asian speakers. And here, um, first looking at the front vowels we find that black speakers consistent with the African-American vowel shift have higher and fronter dress vowels and trap vowels than other speakers. So here we see the dress vowel, black speakers are in blue dress. They have the highest and frontest or the highest dress vowel here. And then also the highest trap vowel. Um, so here we'll play some clips. Uh, first a black speaker with the dress vowel. But I didn't want to go to medical school. And now an Asian speaker's dress vowel. Not as hectic as Atlanta. Hectic. Um, so again, you hear the, the black speaker has the higher and fronter dress vowel. And now looking at, um, again, black speakers, we have the black speakers have the highest and frontest trap vowel. And in contrast, Asian speakers by far have the lowest and backest trap vowel. So I'll play you a black speaker with the trap vowel and then an Asian speaker. It was Asheville, North Carolina passionate about the medical field, passionate. passionate. Now turning to the back vowels, we find that actually all three of the non-white groups have a backer goat vowel than the white speakers. So over here, the white speakers are in red and then other speakers, um, we have Asian speakers in green, black speakers in blue and Latinx speakers in purple and black speakers have the backest goat vowel but actually all three of these groups are backer than the white speakers. And I'll play you some clips. First, a black woman. Uh, Coda is a fantastic building. Now a Latinx person. Woke up, we did an easy run. Now this speaker is Asian. It's like yoga classes and stuff. And this speaker is white. Sustainable focus, but it was. Dakota. What? Woke up. Yoga. Focus. Now, uh, turning to the discussion of our results, we have found some evidence consistent with our hypothesis that politics, a speaker's political orientation, mediates the maintenance or loss of the Southern vowel shift. So we found, again, that the uh, more conservative speakers, according to our continuous metric of conservatism, have more Southern varieties of prize, face, and trap which would be consistent with the idea that these speakers are iconically conserving an older way of speaking because the Southern vowel shift is on its way out. They are the old guard of that way of speaking, uh, perhaps drawing on the rural or local indexical association associated with the Southern vowel shift, perhaps signaling an opposition to a cosmopolitan or region transcending liberal white identity. As for gender and ethnicity, it's perhaps unsurprising to find that men are lagging behind women in the ongoing change in progress, shifting away from the Southern vowel shift, shifting towards the low back merger shift. Very common for women to be changing faster, men to be changing, changing slower, and that's what we find here as well. And then as for the role of ethnicity, we found that um, indeed there's evidence that the Black speakers are showing some African-American vowel shift, um, raising and fronting trap and dress, that actually all three of our non-white groups, Black, Latinx, and Asian speakers, are all um, backing or not fronting the back goat vowel. And then we also find evidence that Asian speakers are leading the charge on this low back merger shift that's been observed across the country with the trap backing. Um, finally, this project has been cool because we are building a diverse new corpus uh, for a holistic picture 
of language as spoken in Georgia, our corpus is homogenous in some ways and that everyone is all the same age and attends the same school, but quite diverse in other ways. It's also still growing. Um, we're excited that some of our speakers have consented to make their reading passages public so that everyone can access them. And we're also excited about the rich speaker metadata that we've gathered through all our Qualtrics survey with both the demographic and political information. And this project has further been fun because it's been a training ground for student researchers. So we're really excited to report our first results and we look forward to um, hearing um, ideas and suggestions. Thank you very much.